Welcome back. Good afternoon. Shabbat Shalom <clears throat> to the 12 tribes and those grafted in as grafted into the 12 tribes of the nation, the scattered nation of Israel. So we started off our last section studying Revelation and we're asking, we're answering this question. Why is the fourth church and the fourth seal and the fourth trumpet Rome? That's what we asked. So we went through and we... <clears throat> Went back through some basics about the book of Revelation, some foundational basics to help us as we study. And now this section, we're going to we're going to eventually go back to Revelation, obviously. But I'm going to start this section in Daniel because Daniel <clears throat> unlocks Revelation and Revelation unlocks Daniel. So we got to bring them both in there. So now we're going to focus in this section on Daniel. And again, the focus, the question we're answering is regarding Rome. So let's look at Daniel and let's start in Daniel chapter two. Now, Daniel chapter two is well known to some of us because Daniel chapter two is where Nebuchadnezzar the king had a dream. If you remember, he had a dream and no one he wanted somebody to not only tell him the interpretation of the dream. He wanted somebody to tell him exactly what he dreamt. And of course, so somebody comes to you and says, I need you to interpret this dream. And you say, okay, tell me the dream. And he said, I can't remember the dream. I need you to tell me what I dreamt and then interpret it. That was Daniel's dilemma. So it was on pain of death. So that if you couldn't tell Nebuchadnezzar his dream, any interpretation, you were going to be put to death. So Daniel, of course, being a prophet, of the southern kingdom of Judah went to the most high with his three friends, his partners, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And they sought out the most high God, the most high Yah of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he revealed to them this thing. So let's take a look in Daniel. Let's start this at Daniel. Going to begin Daniel chapter two. I'm going to start at verse... 17, where the story begins. We're talking about the fourth church, the fourth seal, the fourth trumpet. Remember that, okay? This is what we're talking about now, All right? So here, then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire the mercies of the Most High of Heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the Most High of Heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of Yah forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understand. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou most high of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast made known unto us the king's matter. Therefore, Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he went and said thus unto him, destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king. And I will show unto the king the interpretation. Then Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king hath demanded. Cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? But there is a most high in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar, which shall be in the latter days. And then he says, thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. Now, before we go into it, so he's telling, he showed the Babylonian king a vision, a dream of the last days. 
We're living in the last day. So then he, so now this dream has to go from then till now. You all got that so far. Very important, okay? So you understand. He gave Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a dream whose interpretation extends from then to now. Okay? Now, verse 29 always blows me away because now, so, so now somebody came to you and said, I had a dream and I need you to interpret the dream. And then you say, okay, tell me the dream. And then they say, I can't tell you the dream. I forgot the dream. So I need you to tell me what I dreamt and what it means. Okay? That's amazing, isn't it? So now Daniel is not only going, the Most High did not only reveal to Daniel what Nebuchadnezzar dreamt. He's going to tell Nebuchadnezzar, this is what you were thinking about before you fell asleep. <laughs> He's going he gonna to say, this is what you were thinking about right before you fell asleep. Okay, so let's look at it. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 29. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. So before he fell asleep, he was thinking about the future. That's what he was thinking about. He said, what is, what is waiting for us in the future? What is in the future? How would I know the future? Can I tell the future? See, Nebuchadnezzar was a spiritual man. When you look at the accounts taken in Ezekiel of him, and then even in Babylon, he was one of these people that did not know the truth, but he knew that there were spirits. He knew there was a God. He just didn't know the true one and had respect for spiritual things. Okay, there are people like that on the earth. They don't really follow any church. They don't follow any denomination, but they know there's a God and they know their spirits. Okay, but they haven't found the truth yet. That's Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, and so he was thinking, what's, what's waiting for us in the future? What's going to happen in the future? And then he fell asleep. Okay, verse 30. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. You'll get the answer about the future. Okay, you might know the thoughts of your heart. You won't get the answer about what you're concerned about, what the future holds. Okay, that's why he had magicians and astrologers and soothsayers. He was trying to figure out what the future holds. Okay, that was very important to him. Now the Most High has him in touch with Judah, a prophet from Judah. See, see the pattern now. You got a prophet from Judah coming to the Hamite, going to tell him the future. Because there's no prophets outside of Israel. Okay, here you go. Verse 31. Thou, O king, saw us and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, and his feet of iron and part of iron and part of clay. So let me ask you a question. Pay attention now. This details are extremely important. All right. So let's pay attention here. Now, how many different metals are in the image? Tell me. How many different types of metals are in the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw? Ah, thank you, Brother Mark. Thank you, Yacoba. That's right. There's four different types of metals. So let's go into the order that they was given to him. You see gold, the first. The second is silver, the third is brass, and the fourth is iron. And eventually the iron is mixed with miry clay. But you see four metals, 
And if you notice, you know, comment, I'm not going to say anything that nobody doesn't understand right here. They're in declining order in terms of their value. Gold is the most precious. Then silver. Then brass. Then iron. You notice that, right? So you have four metals. And they're declining in value. The first one's the gold, then the silver, then the brass, then the iron. Okay? So far, everybody's there? Okay. Now, they are, while they're declining in value, they are increasing in hardness. Gold is the softest one. Then silver. Then brass. And the hardest one of all is iron, right? So they're increasing in strength and hardness. So <clears throat> you have a, a situation where there's a decline in value, but an increase in strength. That's important. Y'all see that so far? So you have a decline in value and an increase in strength, right? Let's continue reading. So now we were on, we were in verse um, we did we did down to verse 33, okay? So let's start at verse 34. Daniel chapter 2, verse 34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cat was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smoked the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay, so let's look and see what happened. A stone made without hands. What does that tell you? Whenever something is made without hands, remember what the father said? I don't dwell in temples made with hands, which are figures of the true, telling us that he dwells in a temple not made with hands. The new Jerusalem, not made with human hands. Our bodies, not made with human hands. Okay? So if this stone was made cut out without hands, obviously this is representing something that is done by the Most High. You're, you're following me there, right? So this is representing something that is done by the Most High. Okay? And it said, what did it say it did? It said it smote this image in its feet and crushed, it crushed the iron and clay. And because it smote it in his feet and crushed it, the whole thing came down, right? You can see that. So you crushed it at the, at the base of it. And because the base is crushed, everything came down. And not only did it come down, what we were told is that it turned into something resembling chaff. Chaff is what's left over when you're threshing what? Wheat. The stuff you don't use is called chaff. The thing you are keeping, right, is the grain of the wheat. But the chaff, you're you getting rid of that. So it said it was like the chaff, and it said of the summer threshing floors, because they threshed wheat in the floor of a, of a place, a barn. And it said it, was, it blew away, and there was no place found for it anymore. In other words, it didn't exist anymore. And then it said that the stone that was cut without hands, that smote it, became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So you, the Most High did something where he struck this image and when he destroyed the image, his stone became a great mountain that filled the entire planet. Daniel's going to give us the interpretation. Let's look. Daniel chapter, thir uh, chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 verse 36. Daniel's going to give us the interpretation. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. So he's going to tell them what all of it meant. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the most high of heaven 
have given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, and the beasts of the field, and the fowls of heaven, he hath given into thine hands, and hath made thee ruler over them all, thou art the head of gold. So he's telling Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold is representing your kingdom. Now, let's compare that to Jeremiah. Let's look in Jeremiah. Chapter Jeremiah. Mm, let me see. Jeremiah. Wait a minute. I'm going to find it for you. It's in Jeremiah for sure because we just studied it and I know it's here. Jeremiah. Hold on. Bear with me one second, brethren. We're going to get it. We're going to get it. Uh, hold on. Hold on. Jeremiah, I want to say chapter 21, but I'm, I don't, I'm not committing to that yet. I want to say chapter 21. Hold on. I'm not committing to that yet. Okay, yes, this chapter. <laughs> glad I didn't. It's chapter 25 I was looking for. Okay. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 24. That's what I want. Okay, watch this. All right, so Jeremiah chapter 24. I'm going to start at verse 4. Yes, I'm going to start at verse 4, and I'm going to I'm going to go down. Okay, De Jeremiah chapter 24. I'm going to start at verse 4, and I'm going to go down from there probably down to 14. Yeah, from, from 24 to 14. Okay. I mean, some, excuse me, chapter 25 of Jeremiah from verse 4 to verse 14. Let me be clear. From chapter 25 of Jeremiah from verse 4 to verse 14. And Yahweh has sent you unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them. But ye have not hearkened, nor inclined your ear to hear. They said, turn ye again now, everyone from his evil way and from the evil of your doings. And dwell in the land that Yahweh gave, had given unto you and to your fathers forever and ever. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them, to provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands. And I will do, no, do you no hurt. Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, said Yahweh, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus saith Yahweh of hosts, behold, ye have, ye have not heard my words. Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith Yahweh, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring him, uh, bring them against his this land, and against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations round about you, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment and a hissing and perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take them, I will take that from from them the voice of myrrh and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of millstones and the light of a candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass that when 70 years are accomplished, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, said Yahweh, for their iniquity. And the land of the Chaldeans will make it perpetual desolation. And I will bring upon the land all my words, which I have pronounced against it. Even all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah had prophesied against all nations. For many nations, and kings shall serve themselves of them also, and I will recompense them according to their deeds, according to the works of their own hands. So you can see here, he says, 70 years, I'm going to allow um, the, the uh, kingdom of Babylon to exist for 70 years. And in another place, he says, I'm going to allow it for three generations. It was Nebuchadnezzar, his son, and his grandson. That's how long the kingdom lasts. That's why Belshazzar was Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. So now Daniel is telling Nebuchadnezzar 
Your kingdom is the head of gold. And now we know from Jeremiah, that kingdom was going to last only 70 years from the time they took Judah captive and destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. So it was going to last 70 years, three generations for Nebuchadnezzar. All right. So now let's go back. So then after that, another kingdom was going to come. Right. So you got Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, his son, his grandson. And after that, another kingdom was going to come. So let's take a look. Daniel chapter two. We finished that verse 38 with Daniel telling Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom is the head of gold, the Babylonian kingdom. Now, verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and a third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom, remember now, we're dealing with what? The fourth church, the fourth seal, the fourth trumpet. And what are we looking at here? The fourth kingdom. Got me so far, so far, right? Right? With the fourth kingdom. Here we go. Verse 40. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things as iron that breaketh in pieces that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. So the fourth one is going to be the strongest one, the hardest one, but the least valuable one. You follow me so far? Okay. The fourth one is going to be the strongest one, the hardest one, and the least valuable. Okay, now this next part is very important too. Now, verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. So now, when you see the end of all these kingdoms, the start of it is the head of gold and the finishing of it, is the feet that's mixed with clay and iron, right? You notice that, right? So that at the end of these kingdoms, the iron is going to be represented as ruling. The strength of the iron, you'll see that. So it started with Nebuchadnezzar. We already saw his kingdom was going to be 70 years. And it ended with an iron empire that is the strongest of them, the least valuable, but is going to be in existence at the destruction of all these kingdoms. So far, so good. Are you, you following me so far? Okay, it's important to know that. So now, what we want to find out now, according to the Bible, is who are these kingdoms? That would make sense, right? We want to find out who are these kingdoms that are succeeding Nebuchadnezzar, and then, of course, we'll come to the fourth one. Okay, the fourth one. Okay, so now... We know that Nebuchadnezzar is the head of gold. Okay, so now let's find out. Well, let's read the rest of Daniel's interpretation first. Let's be respectful now. So Daniel chapter 2, verse 41. Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of part of clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the Most High of Heaven set up a kingdom, that's the mountain that fills the whole earth, shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. That means it's not left to the Gentiles. It's Yah's kingdom with Yah's people, okay? Shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great most high have made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof sure. Who is the rock sent without hands that's going to smite the kingdom 
of this world. Who is that stone upon which the kingdom will be established? That's right. Upon this rock. Remember what he said? Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. See, the Christians use this to mean some denomination and it starts with Peter being the rock. No, no. He called him Cephas because the boy was hard headed. Ain't got nothing to do with him being the rock of the church. But you got to understand Israel to understand that. Because didn't he say Israel was stiff necked? Didn't he call James and John the sons of thunder? He said, what am I going to do with you, you sons of Zebedee? Y'all wanting to call down fire on people? <laughs> sons of thunder. That's what he called them. Boy, as you need. And he said, Peter, you a stone. Because that was a hard-headed, stubborn brother. Got nothing to do with him being a rock. <laughs> These fool Gentiles. Anyway, Messiah is the stone cut without hands. That's going to destroy this kingdom. As we saw riding on a white horse, and in righteousness making judgment and war. That's him, okay? That's what's coming. So now, we need the Bible to tell us the succession of kingdom. Do we not? We need the Bible to tell us, okay? We don't want to interpret this ourselves. So he already gave us the goal. The goal is the ancient Babylonian Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom that was followed by evil Merodach and then followed by Belshazzar, and Belshazzar lost it. Wait a minute. That's a hint right there. When did Belshazzar lose the kingdom? The famous phrase that you all know and have heard, Belshazzar saw it first. What phrase is that? He saw the writing on the wall. He's the first one to say, <laughs> I saw the writing on the wall. Only when you and I see the writing on the wall, we know it's time to get he ain't have none of that. He saw the writing on the wall. It was too late. So he was king of Babylon. Okay? He was king of Babylon. And when did his kingdom fall and who did it fall to? Okay? Let's look at Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5. After he saw the writing on the wall, let's cut right to the chase and see the writing on the wall. Let's see. We're going to start at verse 24. Daniel chapter 5, verse 24. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this is the writing, this, and this writing was written, and this is the writing that was written. Mine, mine, tekel, uparsin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mine, Yah hath numbered thy kingdom, Belshazzar, and finished it. Tekel. Thou, Belshazzar, are weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to who? The Medes and the Persians. So after Babylon, the second kingdom was who? The Medes and the Persians. Second kingdom, Medes and Persians. Okay. Verse 29. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that night was Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. So at age 62, Darius took the kingdom, representing the Medes and the Persians. Now, so we have the first Babylon. Then we had the Medes and the Persians. Well, let the Bible tell us what came next. You don't have to guess. The Bible tells us. Let's go to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel 8 will tell us. Now, Daniel's seen a vision in Daniel 8. We're not going to go into all the vision right now. What we're trying to find out, excuse me, is who was the third kingdom and the fourth kingdom. We got the first two, Babylon, and then the Medes and the Persians. Well, who came next? Okay. Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. Beginning at verse 19, Daniel chapter 8, beginning at verse 19, watch carefully, Daniel 8, beginning at 19. And he said, behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media 
in Persia. So now you see Media and Persia. Again, right? Right after Babylon, Media and Persia. All right? And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So the kingdom that came after the Medes and the Persians was who? The kingdom that came after the Medes and the Persians was the kingdom of Greece. And it said that there was a great horn between his eyes and is the first king of the king of the kingdom of Greece. Who was the first king, historically speaking, of the kingdom of Greece? He's talking about him right here. Who was the first king? Who was the conqueror? That's right. It was Alexander, from which you got the change in the name in Egypt to Alexandria, which was called Kemet, but now called Alexandria because Alexander came down here with his seed of the Greeks and stole all the knowledge and took it for themselves and claimed themselves to be the discoverers and started a migration from Europe into Egypt that lasts to this day. So that you have very fair-skinned Egyptians in the northern part and very dark Egyptians that are under slums in the southern part. There you go. So we have Babylon and Medes and Persians and Greece. Now, we're going to let the Bible show us the fourth one, just like we let the Bible show us the first three. But one thing I want to point out again, just as a reminder, as we're going into the fourth empire. I want to point this out to you. Ready? Remember, the fourth empire's influence will last until the return of the Messiah. So whoever the fourth empire is, its influence is felt right now. Okay, got to remember that. So the fourth empire's influence is going to go all the way into the feet and toes of the statue. It is the strongest of all, the most influential, the hardest, but the least valuable to the most high. And it's going to be here in 2021. And in 2022, it's going to be there. The fourth one. So let's keep looking at Daniel chapter 8 and get some hints, okay? Let's look at Daniel 8 and get some hints. We just finished with Greece. So let's read from verse 21 where we saw Greece and read down till we see the rest of Daniel chapter 8 here. I'm going to read from verse 21 down to verse 25 of Daniel 8. Now we're trying to find the fourth, the fourth empire. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the, fourth, is the first king. Now that being broken. Whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation. That means there'll be four divisions coming out of the Greek empire, but not in his own power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall pro prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. In other words, he's going to be a persecutor, a destroyer of Israelites. And through his policy, he's going to be a king, so he's going to make policy. Also, shall he, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. In other words, he comes at you smiling, but then later he's going to kill you. And he shall stand up against the prince of princes, that's against Messiah, and shall be broken without hand. Okay, so we got hints about the fourth one. Let's look at the New Testament for a second and let the New Testament show us the fourth one. Let's look at Luke. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, what came after Greek? Luke chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus 
that all the world should be taxed. Now, whoever, if even if you don't know who Caesar Augustus is, what you must understand from this verse is he's obviously a emperor of the whole world because he sent out a decree to the whole world. So he's a worldwide emperor, this Caesar Augustus. And he said, all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. So who was Caesar Augustus and king of? Who, what was his empire? Obviously, it was Rome. So the fourth one is Rome. Okay? We're not finished yet, though. We're not finished yet? No. We're not finished yet. Rome. Let's look more closely at what Daniel tells us about Rome. Daniel chapter 7 now. Let's go back to 7. So, so far, what do we have so far? Four empires. Now, let me just please preface this. Excuse me if I do that. There have been a multitude of empires on planet Earth, right? There are more, way more than four empires on the planet. You've had dynasties in China. You have empires of Mali, empire of Ghana, empire of Ashanti, empire of, you know, you have uh, um, Timbuktu. You have empires in Africa. You had empire, Britain, Britain had an empire. France had an empire. Portugal and Spain had empire. You had Mayan empires and Aztec empire and Zapotan empires in Central, what's now Central South America. So you had a lot of empire. Why was he picking out these four in particular? Zechariah tells us. So before we're going to go to Daniel 7, but before you go to Daniel 7, let Zechariah explain, let the Bible and through Zechariah the prophet explain to us why did the Most High actually highlight these four particularly? Okay, why? Why, why was it these four he highlighted? Zechariah chapter 1, Zechariah chapter 1, I'm going to start at verse 14 and go down to verse 21. Zechariah chapter 1 from 14 to 21. Zechariah chapter 1. We're going to let Zechariah tell us why did he choose these four? Of all of the empires that existed over the many, many centuries and millenniums, why did he choose these four to highlight in the Bible? Zechariah chapter 1 from verse 14 to 21. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, cry thou, saying, thus saith Yahweh of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy, and I am very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. Therefore, thus saith Yahweh, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith Yahweh of hosts. And a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Cry yet, saying, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, My cities through prosperity shall yet spread abroad, and Yahweh shall yet comfort Zion, and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Then lifted I up my, <clears throat> my eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. Horn represents power. Okay? Four horns are four powers. He said, I saw four horns. And I said to the angel that talked with me, what be these? And he answered me, these are the horns which have done what? Scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Why did he pick these four? Because they were involved in the scattering, the initial scattering of Judah and Jerusalem and, of course, Israel, right? So that's why he picked these four, because they were hand-directing, hand-scattering us, okay? So let's continue. And Yahweh showed me four carpenters, and said I, what come these to do? And he spake, saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. So these four empires that he chose, he chose because of their handling directly of his chosen and the scattering that they had involved in the chosen. That's why he chose these four. You see how the Bible 
gives us the answers to these questions. I love how it answers these things for us. So you see there's four empires, the last being Rome, and he's picked these four because they're used to scatter his Israelite people. And as you saw, when we looked at uh, um, Revelation and when we looked at Daniel, uh, it said, and it, it said the, he's going to persecute the chosen. Daniel 8, remember? He's going to persecute the chosen. So whoever that fourth empire is, is being used to deceive and persecute the chosen people. The people upon which the book of Revelation was given. Okay? So far? Everybody with me so far? Everybody got that so far? So far? Okay, so now let's go more detail to that fourth empire. Rome. Let's go into more detail about Rome. Okay. Daniel chapter seven. Now I'm going to start with Rome. I'm going to start with the fourth beast so we don't waste time. I'm not going to go back into Babylon and Media Persia and Greece right now. I'm going to go right into Rome so that we're going right into because the questions are asked, why is Rome the fourth one? Right? So let's look at let's look at it. Daniel chapter seven, beginning at verse seven. Daniel seven, seven. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. See the iron? And it had great iron teeth and it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. So this particular kingdom is completely different than all the other three that came before it. It's also involved in the scattering of the Israelites. And it's different. What's different about it? We're going to find out right now. Let's continue reading. Daniel chapter 7, now verse 8. And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So this one was different in that a power rose up from within it and it had a big mouth. When he talked about you know, speaking great things, it's not think positive. He's just talking big mess. He popping off. Calling himself Holy Father. And coming out of Rome. A power coming out of Rome that speaks great things. Wait, let's compare that to Revelation chapter 13. Let's, let's look at that, Revelation chapter 13, verse five. <laughs> Revelation 13, verse five. Are you ready? Revelation 13, five. We'll come right back to Daniel. Remember I said they unlock each other. Watch Revelation 13, verse five. Watch. And there was given unto him a mouth. Remember, he had a mouth like a man. Speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months, three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against Yah to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Who are the saints? Is it the Baptist? Is it Jehovah's Witness? Is it the SDA? Who are the saints again? Who did we establish from Revelation chapter one? Who are the servants? Israel. So he's making war with Israel. He's making war with the true Israelites. He's enslaving them. He's enslaving them on multiple fronts. Literal chains. Rome was behind that. Okay. What else? He's enslaving us in economics. He's behind that. What else? He's enslaving us in religion, beating us over the head with a white Jesus that does not exist. Is he not? Make war with the saints and to overcome them. Okay? So the difference the fourth beast has is it starts off like the others. That's right. It starts off as a military conquering power, right? That's wrong, right? They destroyed Jerusalem as a military conquering power, but it turns into a religious power. 
So far, y'all got me? So it turns into a religious power. And it dominates the earth as a religious power. Y'all got me now? All right, it dominates the earth as a religious power and is focused on persecuting Israel. And it says, remember what we read in chapter eight, it says, he shall deceive many and destroy many by craft, slickness. She's hiding in the wilderness and nobody knows she's the one behind all of this. She's the one behind Christianity. She's the one behind every power that's against us. She gives the United States its marching orders. See, now you see it. Got it? Now, let's continue a little bit. I'm going I'm to go a little bit overkill just to press this point because we're going to go back to answer Sister Wade's question. So we're going to go back and look at the fourth church and the fourth seal and the fourth trumpet. We're going to go back and look at it because now we're understanding you know, how Rome is playing this role here, right? Okay. Let's skip down. Let's go to, let's see. Well, I'm going to start at verse 13. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. We're reading about the little horn, but before we do that, we got to read some about Messiah, okay? Because Messiah is going to destroy the little horn and his kingdom. So this, as it showed us in Daniel 2, it shows us in Revelation 19 and other places. But here in Daniel 7, it's showing us too. So here, Daniel 7, beginning at verse 13. Okay, I'm going to read verse 13 first, 13 and 14. Then we're going to hesitate and going to keep going. Okay, and I saw in the night visions, behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days. And they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom. And all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So the son of man, remember what I told y'all before. When Messiah is talking to you and me, he's the son of Yah. He's representing to us what Yah's will is. He's telling us Yah's words. He is giving us the spirit of prophecy, which is Yah's words, right? Son of Yah. But when he represents us to his father, He's the son of man because he's representing man. Okay. Now compare what we just read there. He's receiving a kingdom from his father. He came to his father. The ancient of days, obviously his father. So he came to his father and he received the kingdom. How did he receive the kingdom? Let's go back to Revelation and let it tell us. Revelation chapter five. Let's go back to Revelation and let Revelation tell us how did Messiah receive his kingdom from his father? What did he receive? Revelation chapter 5, beginning at verse 1 and going down to verse 5. Revelation 5, 1 to 5, goes with Daniel 7, 13, and 14. Here we go. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne, that is ancient of days, a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. So father's on the throne in Revelation and he's got a book in his hand with seven seals. It's a closed book. Okay, let's continue. Verse two. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven, nor in the earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book, neither to even look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So the line of Judah, who is the son of man, is prevailed to open the book that he's going to get from his father. 
Okay, let's continue reading. See, Revelation chapter 5, from verse 5 to verse 7. What did he give him? Looks like a book. Let's see it happen. Verse 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and in the midst of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Yahweh sent forth into all the earth. So the lamb has seven horns. What does that mean? Perfect power. It was given him from his father. Seven eyes, what does that mean? Perfect vision. And they are the seven spirits of his father. Perfect righteousness. Sent forth into all the earth. Verse seven. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. So the kingdom given him was in the form of a book. And the book is sealed with seven seals. So when we see the seals being opened, what you are seeing is the Messiah unsealing the book that represents the inhabitants of his kingdom. Let me say that again. So the seven seals is the Messiah unsealing the scroll of the book that represents his kingdom, the inhabitants of his kingdom written in there, and he's unsealing it. And each time he's unsealing it, it's representing a time period. Okay? You following me so far? So the father and Daniel gives him a kingdom. The kingdom is, is inscribed in this scroll that represents the people who are the servants of the kingdom. In other words, what are we talking about? The book of life. The dead were judged out of those things written in the book. Whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the book of life contains the names of all the inhabitants of Messiah's kingdom. And when it is completely unsealed and is opened, he comes to take his servants. You got me? He comes to claim, proclaim, to announce, to take his servants into his kingdom. And with righteousness, he does judge and make war. Okay? You got me so far? So are we talking about Rome? Let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. We're talking about Rome, right? Let's go back to Daniel chapter 7. So now we see the kingdom being given to the Messiah, who is the stone cut with our hands, who shall destroy this earth and create a mountain of his kingdom that fills the whole earth. And he shall live forever and shall not pass away. And his kingdom shall never be destroyed. And it shall not be left to other people. Okay? Verse 15 of Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, beginning at verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings that shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other which came up, before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellow. I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Watch this next verse. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse or different from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth. 
and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Who is ruling this earth in secret? Who devours the whole earth? And, and it's different from a normal kingdom. You can't really see it because she's in the wilderness ruling and riding the beast, right? And she comes out of Rome and she's different from any other empire. And she's religious in power because she speaks against the most high. There you go. Okay, so we now know that the fourth beast is the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, and we know that its rulership today is based on religion. It's based on worship. And through its Christianity, has it not circled the whole planet? Has it not? Through Christianity, has it not circled the whole planet? The whole earth? Has he not pushed it and devoured his the servants of Yah in it? Yes, he is. Okay, now let's go to Revelation. And let's look at these, let's look at these, these churches, the seven churches of Revelation. We're not gonna look at all seven. We're talking about the fourth one now, though. We're talking about the fourth one. So we're gonna we're gonna zero in. Okay. But I need to read the third one first. So we need to lead to read the lead up to the fourth one. Okay, there's a lead up to the fourth one. And the third one gives us a lot of hints. And it gives us hints starting with the doctrine of Balaam. That's very important because who was Balaam? Now, when you read numbers, you'll see about Balaam. Balaam was a prophet that sold his gift for money to try to curse Israel. He acted like he was their friend, and he is the one that advised Moab to send women into the camp to cause them to commit fornication, having sex with women that worship other gods, and to eat things sacrificed to idols, to eat unclean things that Yah said you shouldn't eat. Balaam was the was the was the counselor behind that. But Moses revealed that to us in Numbers, and not only that, he gonna reveal it here. Revelation chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because this is under, by the way, this is under Pergamos. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak. So Balaam taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also that Hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. If you read the New Testament, you will decipher the doctrine of Nicolaitans represents grace with no works. Represents, I'm not works, represents, um, for, well, Jude says it. Let me say, what Jude says it better than that. That's why I'm stumbling about. Jude calls it, this is what Jude calls it. Uh, let's see. Jude calls it. Um, beloved, when I gave all diligence, verse three, to write unto you of the com the need of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exalt you that you could earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in otherwares who were before ordained of this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our Most High into lasciviousness. That's the doctrine, to turn grace into something that says there's no law, which is what we all know that that exists, right? So that's what the doctrine of Nicolaitans is. It turns grace into lasciviousness. Paul also talks about it. He warned the Ephesus church about it in Acts chapter 21. He warned the Ephesian elders about that. And, and so that's what we're talking about. So in this era that represents Balaam, they're also starting to teach grace does away with the law. Where did Christianity come from? Did it not start with Constantine? Okay, let's continue. Revelation chapter two, verse 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of Nicolaitans, which things I hate, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear with the spirit set unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, 
and I will give him a white stone. And in the stone, a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Now, here we are after the beginning with Balaam. We're coming now to the fourth period, the fourth church, Thyatira. And let's watch carefully what is described as Thyatira with all the knowledge that we now have from Daniel. Look, let's look carefully at what this fourth church says, what, what it says about it. Okay, what the Messiah is talking to us about it. Verse 18, Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira says, right, these things saith the son of Yahweh, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy faith and the faith and thy patience and thy works, the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that woman. A woman represents what? You'll know a woman represents a religious entity. It's Yah's woman, the woman with 12 stars, or it's the whore, right? Well, which one is this? Thou suffers that woman Jezebel. Now you know who she is, which calls herself a prophetess. The beast, the dragon, and the false prophet to teach and to seduce my servants. How does she do that? With Christianity. To commit fornication, to worship other gods, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. No food is unclean, not in Christianity. There's no unclean food. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. Then it says she's the mother of harlots, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. See? So now you have the fourth church. It's the same as that harlot in Revelation 17, with whom the kings of the earth commit fornication. And we saw that the fourth beast shall be different from the others and shall subdue the whole earth. See, you got the whole earth twice. The whole earth being subdued by the little horn, different from all the rest. The little horn attacking Yah's servants. The little horn now is a woman which commits fornication with the kings of the earth. And Jezebel is here saying the same thing. She commits fornication with the kings of the earth. You see in that. Everybody, okay? Sister Wade, you, you at? I can't see over there. Sister Wade, hopefully you got that. So now let's compare the fourth church to the fourth seal. Then we'll look at the fourth trumpet. Let's look at the fourth seal. This is Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, verse 7. Revelation 6, verse 7. Let's compare what we just read about Thyatira and what we also read in Daniel to now the fourth seal. The fourth seal of the book of life that's being opened. Now we're the fourth seal. Let's take a look. That's Revelation chapter 6, verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I looked and behold, a pale horse and his name that sat on him was Death and hell followed with him. And power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. Okay, did Rome do those things? Yes. Are they still doing it? Yes. Let's continue and look at the fourth trumpet. Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8 beginning at verse 12, Revelation chapter 8, beginning at verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So darkness came upon the earth. So you have a pale horse that causes death. You have a Jezebel woman that teaches Yah's servants to worship idols, 
to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. You have a little horn that subdues the whole earth and, and also attacks Yah's servants. It's permitted to. Why was he permitted to? Because of the, our sins and the sins of our fathers and worshiping other gods. See that? So now when it's talking about darkness of sun and moon and stars, that's talking about darkness, spiritual darkness. So that this entity brought spiritual darkness on the earth. And it started with the one before it, the third one that brought wormwood. And remember wormwood in Deuteronomy chapter 29, wormwood and gall represent people that are teaching false doctrines out of the imagination of their own hearts. So it started with Pergamos in the third church, and then it goes and develops into Thyatira in the fourth church, and it started here with wormwood in the third seal, uh, the third trumpet, and it develops into darkness in the fourth one. It started with blackness and and the, and, and basis of, on money in the third horse, which is the third seal, and it turns into a pale horse and death. It's the abomination. Besides, say what? The abomination that causes desolation. Okay, the abomination that causes desolation. Okay, y'all caught y'all caught all that. Y'all caught. Okay, did I, Sister Wade? Did I did I answer the question? I know it was long and detailed, but we need, as you can see, we needed all of that to you know to get the clarity. You know when we come forth here, and as you will note, as I said, if you if you go ahead and read the seven churches and parallel them with the seven seals and parallel them with the seven trumpets, you will be amazed. You will see a lot. And compare what you're reading to what the prophets say in the Old Testament, you will be blown away. You will. You'll be blown away. Okay. Um, yeah. Praise the Most High, Yah. Okay. I ain't seen Sister Wade yet. I hope she's still here. I ain't seen Sister Wade. Well, okay, okay. Praise the Most High. All right. Um, so it's all recorded. So you can review it. You know, you can review all of these things. The first, the two parts that we went through, all of the scriptures, review them. I would really, really uh, uh, advise you to review them for yourself, all of them, and read more, you know, uh, of the word in these areas. But some things I didn't have time to read, like I said, I, for the sake of time. But, and also go through the Daniel series and the Revelation series on the website. You will also See that there, Daniel series and the website, rawhebrewremnant.org. And the same thing, you can see the Revelation series on the website. And so you'll see both of those playlists there, and you'll be able to go through each, you know, and look at your Bible and study it out. Okay, study it out for yourself. Praise the Most High Yahweh. Well, again, if you have any questions later, catch me on the email. Um, you know, you know how to reach me through the email there, rawhebrewremnant12.com. Uh, that's the email. Uh, at gmail, excuse me, raw Hebrew remnant 12 at gmail.com. And so you'll see that, and then you'll be able to send any questions you have. And of course, you could also, you know, put them in the uh, below in the comment box if you want to as well. So may the most high bless you and keep you, and may he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace. Shalom. Shalom.